So are we ready? Hello? Yes, everyone's in, Carl, if you want to go ahead and get started. Okay. okay. Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to uh, tonight's Cal Poly Pomona Black Alumni and Friends Black Health Forum. Um, Real excited uh, to have you here and I'm very excited uh, to welcome uh, an esteemed uh, group of panelists that are going to be sharing perspectives and, and thoughts with us. Um, got a few guidelines here before we get started. Um, I want everyone to stay on mute. And um, we have some questions already submitted, but if you have questions along the way, which I'm sure some many of you will, uh, you can submit those via chat. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll be able to get to everything, but uh, we're gonna try to address uh, as many questions as we possibly can. Our panel consists of um, three this evening. Um, our special guests, Michael Frierson will share, uh, he's gonna share the unique health journey of his son, Michael Jr. and give us invaluable perspectives of, um, you know, kind of uh, the journey that they've been on in recent years. Michael is a um, uh, Cal Poly alumnus, Michael and his wife, Diane. Uh, we were actually colleagues uh, during our four years at Cal Poly. And I'm really excited to see them here and uh, I'm very thankful that they're here to share uh, what's going to be some extremely valuable information. After that, we'll have Dr. Zuri Morell, who is an acclaimed colorectal specialist and surgeon. He also happens to be Michael's surgeon and volunteered to join us this evening. He's a crusader for educating our community, and for that, we are very grateful. And then we're going to bring on Dr. Sherilyn Cook. She's a primary care physician, internal medicine specialist, public health educator. She's the president of the Sinclair Miller Medical Association. And that's just for starters, that's not everything. And proudly, Dr. Cook is a Cal Poly alum. So welcome. And um, with that, we'll go ahead and get started by um, bringing up uh, Michael Frierson. Um, Michael, let's see. Again, Michael's son, Michael Frierson Jr., uh, was diagnosed with colon cancer a few years ago, about three, four years ago. And um, he is um, in the midst of uh, battling this, uh, this situation. Um, and when I talked with Michael recently, Michael's dad, who was on with us, um, he, uh, you know, we talked about the possibility of uh, having Michael share his experiences with others. And uh, the conversation went that um, he would be very, very interested in sharing with others. So uh, with that, I'm going to leave it to Michael Frierson to uh, kind of discuss what's, you know, you know, the, the journey that they've been on and, um, and uh, their, their insights and things that they can share with us to help. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my son would have loved to have been here today to speak, uh, to, to talk, of, talk about his, his journey but uh, he's in the hospital right now. We've had a little setback and we're trying to figure out uh, what's going to be the next step uh, or the next direction for him. Um, uh, my son is 37 years old and he was diagnosed in 2016 with stage three rectal cancer. Um, you know, it kind of caught us all by surprise. Um, Interesting on how we found out about it uh, back, I think in the beginning of 2015, both he and I were, uh, were working out and, you know, we were well, actually, he called me, he wanted to try to get back in shape. He thought he was really out, he was out of shape. So he wanted to start back to working out. So we went jogging on the beach and he couldn't run, he couldn't run 20 yards. And so he was, you know, apologizing about 
not being in good shape. And, and I quickly recognized that this was something more than that and had him uh, go talk to his internist. Uh, when they did some blood work on him, they found out that uh, you know, his, his, um, his red blood cell count wasn't, wasn't high enough really to sustain life for a person of his age. Uh, initially, we thought he was suffering from leukemia, and we went through all of the phases of, of getting that checked out, um, and it wasn't leukemia. Uh, he uh, then went to a gastroenterologist, um, and uh, he was diagnosed by the gastroenterologist of having um, uh, the beginning stages of an ulcer. So. Uh, now, understanding when he when he had his colonoscopy done, he had probably a hundred polyps in his in his colonoscopy in in his colon. So he should have immediately been recommended to go to a uh, colorectal surgeon, and he wasn't. They put him on some medication that was um, uh, helped was set up to help prevent ulcers. Uh, it kind of stopped some of the bleeding that was associated with the with the polyps that he had, and he started feeling better. Uh, for about six months, he was, you know, back back to his regular self. And after they took him off of the uh, the antibiotics for the for the for the um, uh, for the ulcer, the situation got worse again. So in 2016, um, uh, they did another colonoscopy and you know told him that he was going to have to have his uh, his colon removed. That's when we were introduced to Dr. Zuri Morell. And uh, you know, Zuri has been wonderful throughout this entire process. Um, I'm going to let him talk about the clinical diagnosis on this, um, on, on what Michael suffered, was suffered with. But you know, at the end of the day, because of the delay of us getting to him, uh, you know, he, he started seeing signs of cancer. And so, from two, 2016, January 2016 to date. You know, he's been in a pretty tough battle, you know, for actually a battle for his life. Uh, I think the most important part of this is, though, is not the fact that he's, you know, he's, he's going through this battle. I mean, we know what we're up against and we know what we're having to deal with. It's the fact that this happened to somebody his age. I mean, this is not something that you expect to see uh, in a young man, 34, 33 years old. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of frightening that, you know, at least in my discussions with Zuri, that this type of thing is happening more, more often than what we know about. And one of the big problems that I see with us is that we have a tendency not to talk about these things and not to get the people that we really care about when we see things happening to them that, you know, don't, don't look quite right, that we're not pressing them to get checked up. And that doesn't make a difference if you're 34 years old, 25 years old, or 50 years old. You know, we have a tendency to not push the people that we care about to care about themselves. Now, I can tell you that, you know, the situation with Michael, we probably recognized this problem a lot earlier, at least the fact that he was having some issues a lot earlier than 34, because all the time we would see him, you know, it didn't look quite right. You know, we always associated it with him, you know, overworking or working too hard. And, uh, you know, never really pushed him at that point in time to, to get things checked out. And, you know, we probably, you know, could have done a better job, as, you know, monitoring his health, even though he was a grown man at the time, he should have been monitoring his own health better. Sometimes, you know, we kind of fall into that state of denial that, you know, well, it'll be okay. You know, it'll, you know everything's going to get off. Everything will be okay. All I have to do is do all of these different things, take more vitamins, exercise more, and everything will be okay. And I think that we really, really need to, as, a, you know, as, as, as especially African Americans, need to stress the fact that, you know, we need to get annual physicals. We need to understand some of the dilemmas that we, especially from, a, 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 from, a, from the standpoint of uh, heredity, uh, we need to understand some of the dilemmas that we face, what our past history is, and what our family history is. And we need to get focused on that, and we need to talk to our children about that, and we, make, we need to make sure that the young people uh, in our family or young people that we're close to are getting 
annual physical examinations. I mean, I think that is just way too important. Uh, you know, I kind of feel a little bit bad about my son's situation because he shouldn't be in this position right now. And I have to take some of the, some of the blame on that as being his father, you know, because that's something I should have been stressing to him instead of allowing him or, you know, making the assumption that he, you know, he would have known these things. So if we don't get anything out of these discussions today, and like I said, I'm gonna keep this really short. If we don't get anything out of the, these discussions today. The one thing that I hope we do get out of this is that if you really care about people around you, you know, don't, don't let them off the hook when you know that things aren't right. I mean, you need to point them in the direction to be absolutely sure that they're getting the, the proper attention. And it doesn't make a difference if, it's, if they're suffering from high blood pressure, <laughs> uh, diabetes, uh, you know, forms of heart failure. You know, you need to make people go see doctors. You need to make them go get checked out when they're not doing well. Because that's an important thing. If you catch these things early, you don't have the complications that we're going through right now. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be a death sentence all the time. Thanks, Michael. That was that was very well said. And Mr. Crawford, can I just say say one thing quickly um, about this? Not to get too specific with your son's case, but the hard part in medicine is when you do do the right things. Um, and, and they did actually. And so the hardest part, and we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit, is that they did do the right thing. They actually came to get treated early in terms of, or diagnostically treated early. And the doctor, it was this doctor's fault that happened with them. So, so that's the hard part is even when you do things right, sometimes you have to still be your own advocate, but, but I've told them this before, they actually did not wait at all. They just, you know, they, they had a, had someone who who did not handle business properly okay thank you <laughs> okay and can i share my screen so with that yeah i'm going to give you a full introduction now dr oh. <laughs> thank you <laughs> now we're going to bring up dr morell who again who was the treating surgeon on michael frierson jr um, Dr. Morell is a leading Los Angeles colorectal surgeon and specialist, currently chairman of the Cancer Committee of the Samuel Ocean Comprehensive Cancer Institute, attending surgeon and physician member on the board of directors of Cedar Sinai Medical Center. Dr. Burrell, Morell is board certified in colorectal and general surgery with his own practices located in Beverly Hills and Los Alamitos, LA colon, rectalsurgeon.com, LA colon rectalsurgeon.com. It has over 40 publications and articles and book chapters. Dr. Morell specializes in hemorrhoids, colon cancer, rectal cancer, Crohn's disease, colitis, IBD treatment, and colonoscopies. Also the developer of anal rejuvenation. I'll give you Dr. Zuri Morell. Thank you. I'm, I'm, uh, thank you everyone for coming tonight. And while we're going to be talking about colorectal cancer, what we're really talking about and what I really want to talk about is um, being your own healthcare advocate. And so I'm going to try to share the screen now. Can you, can you guys see the screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Alrighty. So what I always tell people is I start by saying, making everybody on the call and everybody I talk to, I want everybody to say the words colon. I want to hear you. Colon. 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 Say the words rectum. rectum. And I want you to say the hard one. The word is anus. 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 Yes. And I want you to say, you shouldn't die from fear. You shouldn't you die, die, from die from fear. 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 And you shouldn't die from embarrassment. And you shouldn't die, die, from, die from, embarrassment. from embarrassment. And that's what's often happening to a large portion of us. So colorectal, what if I tell you that there's a cancer that is responsible for um, about 50,000 deaths a year, 
and about uh, 150,000 new diagnoses, okay? And this happens every year. But I'm gonna tell you that it's almost completely preventable. Now, does that make sense to anybody? How does, how does colorectal cancer account for the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths of men and women? And yet, I'm telling you that it's almost completely preventable for patients without a genetic disposition. So the question is, why are so many people dying? Like, why, 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 how do these two things jive? And the reason for most people is often fear and it's often embarrassment. Nobody likes the thought of getting diagnosed. Nobody likes the thought of, of, getting, of getting a colonoscopy. What I tell patients is that a colonoscopy is the best test to not diagnose cancer, to actually prevent colon cancer. I tell patients that colorectal colonoscopy is not to find cancer you actually prevent colon cancer by getting colonoscopies, okay? All colon cancer starts as these little growths called polyps. And these polyps eventually will turn into cancer, certain polyps will. And you are able to take the polyps out during the colonoscopy. And this is why this test is very, very important. Now, real briefly, when people say, what is colorectal cancer? So cancer in general is uncontrolled cell growth. That means that we lose the ability for our, for our cells to stop replicating. So the reason my hands or my fingers are this long, and the reason my nose is this wide is because, and not wider, my fingers aren't longer, is because my cells knew when to stop growing. Well, with cancer of any type, the cells lose the ability to stop growing. And so they keep growing and growing and they outgrow their blood supply. They take a lot of our, your energy, our nutrients, and that's how people end up succumbing to cancer. They can go other places. So colorectal cancer starts in the colon. The colon is about five feet long, and what it actually is, it does is that it absorbs salt and water. When I usually ask people, what's the colon for, everybody says to make poop. That's not the colon's job. After you eat, you, food goes in your mouth, you masticate, it goes down your esophagus, goes to your stomach. Your stomach, as we all know, has acid. It grinds up the food, and then everything that's absorbed, all major absorption occurs in the small intestine. By the time it gets to the colon, the only job of the colon is to reabsorb water for your body. So... That's the number one job of the colon. The number one job of the rectum is to actually hold the feces until a socially appropriate time to, to release it. So once again, cancer is the growth of abnormal cells. And so the causes of colorectal cancer, we actually still don't know most of the causes of colorectal cancer. 8% are about genetic changes, can be hereditary syndromes, but most of it is actually caused by just changes related to our DNA. So we're born with two copies of most of our of most of our, our genes, most of our proteins, everything, okay? And so how do these copies sometimes get uh, mutated? Well, sometimes you could be born with one mutation. However, what mutates the other is environmental factors. So most of these DNA changes are actually related to our lifestyle. Now you see I have, you know, red meat here, okay? Things like that is what we put in our bodies, is what we eat. And so when you look at who's at risk, it's about 90% of colorectal cancers are diagnosed in people over the age of 50. However, we're seeing a 12-fold increase in millennials now getting colorectal cancer. That means people 40 and younger. We're seeing a, a, that much increase. Why is that? Well, did you guys know that approximately 65% of millennials will be obese by the age of 35 in America? Obese, not overweight, obese. That is a huge cause of, of why we're seeing an increase in these cancers. It's also processed food consumption, things like that, which we'll talk about. So African-Americans are more likely than any other racial group to get colorectal cancer, to, to be diagnosed at a higher stage, and to actually die from their disease. And it's not really gender related. Men and women are almost equally affected. Why is that? So there's many reasons for that. And it's not something inherent about being African-American that actually, that actually causes this. The number one cause of cancer-related deaths in Koreans, for instance, is also colon cancer, colorectal cancer. So the question is, why are these things happening? So when you look at anything in America um, and they look at racial you know, discrepancies, they always compare whites and blacks, and they always say it must be a money issue. So they've actually even done studies where they take rich African-Americans, rich Caucasians, middle, middle, poor, poor, and still find out that even wealthy African-Americans are offered colonoscopies or get colonoscopies as much as their wealthy white counterparts, okay? Now, 
This brings us to another, uh, another topic in terms of being your healthcare advocate. There's many studies, many studies that show that, for instance, black babies live longer and healthier to the age of 18 when they have black pediatricians. African-American patients do better on all points when they have African-American doctors. So why is that? Well, part of it is, I tell patients all the time, you have to be comfortable with your doctors, but I tell doctors, you have to be comfortable with your patients. I can tell you until the, uh, the passing of Chadwick Bozeman at such a young age, every patient that came to me, especially my male patients, would come because the wife would tell them or the significant other would say, look, you need to get tested. Uh, you need to get checked out. Every person I talked to, especially my African-American male patients, I would say, look, you need a colonoscopy. And everybody would say, I don't want anybody sticking things in my butt. That's, that's what it is. That's what it comes down to, okay? And I would say, look, this is what you need. I would say, number one is, do you love yourself? And they say, doc, I lived a good life. I'll be fine. Uh, do you love your wife? Yes, but she'll be okay. And the way I get them to do it is, do you love your kids? And they say, what do my kids have to do with it? I said, well, if you get your colonoscopy and I find a cancer or polyps, then you would tell your child and they would get their colonoscopy sooner and often it would be paid for by insurance companies. To tell you a quick story, my father, I had to convince him to get a colonoscopy when I was a resident. My dad actually um, said, I'm getting a colonoscopy, Zuri. He goes to get it, he comes back and I see he drives up in, the, in, the, uh, in our driveway and he's walking hunched over and he's like, I can't believe you do this for a living, that was terrible. I said, dad, you didn't have a colonoscopy. You must have had a flex sig because you have to have somebody drive you back home. A flexible sigmoidoscope is often done in somebody's office, in a family medicine or some other doctor's office, where they look at the lower third of your colon. Okay, you're awake when you have that test. There's really not a lot of times you get good views. But in the past, it was a good test because most polyps that were precancerous were found on the left side, lower part of the colon. However, for African Americans, most of our polyps are on the right side. So that test is almost completely useless for us for prevention of cancer and even diagnosis, okay? We're also seeing in America now for all ethnic and racial groups, all of the polyps are, and cancer, a lot of it is moving to the right side of the colon, which you have to have a colonoscopy for. So I have my dad go back and get his actual colonoscopy and approximately one foot from where the end of the sigmoidoscopy was, he had five polyps, okay? five polyps that would have been a cancer within about maybe five to 10 years if he did not have it removed. Subsequent, he's had about three colonoscopies. He's had a total of about 10 polyps. So I know his family history. So I'm turning 46 tomorrow. When I was 42, I got a colonoscopy and they found a two centimeter high grade dysplastic polyp in me. Now I usually make a joke and say, you know how hard it was for me to do my own colonoscopy, but nobody can do that. You don't do your own colonoscopy. And so this polyp, if I would have waited, would have ended up being cancer. And so I knew my family history, so I got my colonoscopy. And that's what I share with my patients, especially us, is that this test not only is preventative, okay? Nobody likes the thought of, of this scope going into their butt. Nobody likes the thought of the, of the prep that you do the day before. But everybody loves the thought of being able to significantly, significantly impact their generations, their, their future generations, their kids, their grandkids, this is why this test is so important. Now, you have to be comfortable enough with your patients to tell them um, this is what you need. So there's other tests that can be offered. Like there's a big push by a certain health system, starts with a K, which is actually, they do really good for prevention, but they do this big thing about Cologuard. Cologuard is a stool test that you can actually take to, and it's really good at finding cancer. However, it's not good at finding polyps. And the point of a colonoscopy is to prevent cancer by finding polyps and removing the polyps during your colonoscopy. The usual age and the age for African Americans for about six to seven years to get this has been 45 because of our statistics. However, another study was published where they looked at gastroenterologists and they asked gastroenterologists, when should African American get colonoscopies? 75% thought it was 50, did not know the new data, okay? 75% of the African American GI doctors, 90% knew. Okay, so when you think about 25%, that means that, that that's so small that they knew even the guidelines that had moved up for African Americans. So that is something that everybody needs to take in consideration. What I tell patients, in, no matter who you have as, as a physician, no matter what race, you need to be your own advocate, which means you need to come to the doctor's um, appointment prepared. 
I tell patients all the time, we're a team. I don't dictate to my patients. We work on problems together. I ask them what their goals are and I tell them what I think they should do, but we, we agree on this together. And I tell patients all the time, we, we love to say that our African-American patients are good patients, uh, meaning that don't ask questions, and, and all doctors like a good patient, right? Because we get pulled in so many directions with HMOs, with health systems, you have to see X amount of patients in a, in a given amount of time. And so, you know, we love patients who don't ask questions. Well, those problems is a me problem. That, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's my problem. I need to figure out how to navigate. That, is not, that should not be a patient problem. You should go to the appointment. I tell patients all the time, have a piece of paper, sit down and open that paper. Nine times out of 10, the doctor's gonna sit down, answer your questions and discuss with you how we make you healthier and how we do it together. So that's what this is really about. When you look at other risk factors for colorectal cancer, it's obesity is huge, it's diets that are high in fat and high in red meat. One of the reasons that uh, Koreans and Korean Americans, um, this is number one cause of cancer related death is because there's a lot of, uh, of Korean barbecue and Golby beef that is eaten. And this is beef that's actually barbecue. All of us, I love barbecue. I don't eat it often, but I love barbecue too. So I'm not telling people just to, to cut it out completely. However, you know, I eat red meat now maybe once every two months. And I tell other people, if you eat red meat every single day, if you drop it even to maybe twice a week, that will still end up helping you, okay? The way we digest red meat is into something called a nitrosamine. Nitrosamine is basically a precancerous material that if you lay that on cells, eventually there will be a cancer there. That's just how we digest it. And even pork is digested like that. It's not the other white meat like everybody loves to say, okay? Obesity is huge. When, we have, when we're obese, it's a chronic inflammatory condition in our whole body. So obesity is responsible for every, almost every cancer you can look at, and obesity is a risk factor for that. Obviously, smoking, um, diets that are low in fruits and vegetables. I tell all patients, and, and all of us, whether you're a patient or not, we need 25 to 30 grams of fiber every day. Now, when I say fiber, everybody thinks about like Metamucil, Citrusil, and I used to say, oh man, that's for old people. Listen, everybody needs fiber because fiber helps to hold water in the colon, okay? It's not absorbed, and it helps decrease something called our colonic transit time. Colonic transit time is, you know, I can have patients go and get an expensive test where we actually can measure how long it takes for waste to get into your colon to how long it takes for you to empty. However, I love to tell patients a quick and dirty way you can do this, and I do this from time to time, you eat a plate of beets. As soon as you eat a plate, when you eat a plate of beets, you, you just wait to see when you look down, when you wipe and you get scared that you think you're bleeding, okay? That tells you as a proxy of what your colonic transit time is. That tells you how quickly things and waste move from your body to out of your body, okay? You want it to be about 24 to 36 hours. So that's something that is very important. And if you, if you move um, the beets out that quickly, then you're probably getting enough fiber. You're probably getting enough fruits and vegetables, okay? Something else that is incredibly important, especially during this pandemic, low vitamin D levels, okay? Low vitamin D levels are associated with, with colorectal cancer. And guess what? Afri as African-Americans, we have low vitamin D levels often, and especially during COVID. Vitamin D is a hormone that's activated when the sun hits our skin, okay? We have to be out in the sun longer because of melanin. We have to be out in the sun longer to make increased levels of vitamin D, right? Now, nobody's hardly going outside anymore. And, you know, we're probably, we may be shutting down again. And so every day, my whole family, you know, we take vitamin D. Vitamin D is also one of the number one causes of depression in adolescence. And especially now during, during this time, it's something that all of us need to be privy to. Lastly, it's really important, once again, to know your family history, not just if you have cancer, Okay, not if you just have colon cancer, but even polyps. I tell people that the best time to talk about this is at the dinner table because if people say, oh, this is disgusting. I don't want to talk about this at the dinner table. It's important to talk about it because that's when you're putting, that's when you're either doing good by your body or you're doing bad by your body by eating. But it's important to tell your kids, I had this many polyps, you may want to get tested earlier. And once again, all colorectal cancer starts as these growths called polyps. Okay, and these polyps can be removed when you have a colonoscopy. In terms of reducing your risk, um, eating more fruits and vegetables, physical activity, uh, limiting high fat foods, especially red meat. Um, I even give a talk to adolescents about the fire hot Cheetos diet, okay? If you look at a Cheeto, if I ask you, is a Cheeto a potato or is it corn? What is a Cheeto, right? It's processed, it's nothing, right? It's literally processed, especially with the red dye and you know, all of those things. I mean, there's, there's patients that eat something else called uh, Takis, 
a, a kid had a major ulcer. I think he was like 10 years old from eating these kind of processed foods, these spicy processed foods. You have to be mindful when you let your kids eat like this. And it's hard. Trust me. I hate saying no. My wife calls me a grandpa because I, I have two daughters and I let them do whatever they want except this. Okay. You have to really hone in on them because how we eat is how they're going to eat. And that's how they're going to teach your grandkids, i.e. their kids to eat. Okay. In addition, vitamin D, very important uh, as discussed already. Once again, fiber, the best way to get fiber, and this is what I love to do, blackberries, blueberries, raspberries have amazing amounts of fiber, about 5.6 to 6.5 grams per cup. So we do two cups of any of these berries, almond milk, Almond milk only has 40 calories. I do a protein powder. I do ice. We blend that. And that's our breakfast every morning. So I try to walk out the house with at least 12 grams of fiber. And then the rest you can make up as you, as you go throughout the day. And so I know there's other speakers. I just kind of wanted to share all this with you is that this is often preventable. I also want to share that if you, you know, it's really important uh, once you get your colonoscopy results once you have it. So, so I guess I should say, who, who would qualify for a colonoscopy? Um, young people often come to me, and one of my specialties is, is um, dealing with progressed cancer in, in young patients. The reason that happens is often the patients themselves will put off if they have rectal bleeding, they'll say it's just hemorrhoids. But what's often sadder is they'll go to the doctor, and the doctor will look and say it's just hemorrhoids. The key I tell patients, no matter what your problem is, you go to the doctor, you say, if this doesn't work, what's the next step? Okay, what's the next step? That's how you leave an appointment. So then you don't keep coming back and they just say the same thing over and over again. You say, so perfect example, if you have rectal bleeding, for instance, okay, there's two types. There's bright red blood per rectum, which a lot of times can be hemorrhoids. But if you're over the age of 45 or have a family history, that's an automatic colonoscopy. Even over 40, I'm pretty aggressive when it comes to that. If you're somebody younger, maybe no family history of colorectal cancer, then you can treat it. You see, you treat it or, you know, you take medicines, you take suppositories. If it's not better, you can go back to your family doc and, you know, they may treat you with something else for another month. But if that's not better, you should see a specialist. Okay. Like, and, and your and most family doctors are fantastic and they will have you do this. If you have blood mixed in stool, I don't care how old you are, that's an automatic colonoscopy. Not because it's cancer necessarily, but it could be Crohn's disease. It could be inflammatory bowel disease. It could be uh, large polyps, things like that. And so this is something that a lot of us would not know. But, it's, uh, but even if you just ask your doctor, even if you're not sure, say, if this doesn't work, what's my next step? That will at least start the conversation. And now with you know, Google, the internet, everything, you can look a lot of things up. I don't, I'm not a big fan of Dr. Google, but I love having patients that are that are very engaged. And, and that wasn't always the way for me. When I first started at, at Cedars, you know, all my black patients, I, I could tell, I can say anything. And they listen to me, they say, thank you, doctor. A lot of my Jewish patients would come in and they would ask a lot of questions. They would have articles and things. And at first I was, I, I was saying, well, do they not trust me? Is it because I'm, I look young? Is it because I'm black? But culturally, they're taught a lot of times to ask a lot of questions. And that's something I have my kids do all the time now. They, they have to ask their pediatrician two questions before they leave the office. And so this, this is, all of this stuff I think is very important. It's very important, especially for us, because despite the negative stereotypes that we have about us being aggressive and things like that, we never are in the doctor's office or anywhere else. We actually are just, we're, we listen to what the doctors say and we trust him. We're very trusting. And I think, you know, that's a great way to be. And, you, and people shouldn't necessarily argue back and forth with their doctors, but it's a team. And so you have to be prepared. That helps me be prepared. And that's really what, you know, what I wanted to discuss today. Wow. And if I can make one comment, being a parent going through this right now, get your young, I mean, talk to your sons and your daughters, have conversations with them about getting checked. I mean, even if it, had, even if it costs you a little bit of money, and I know insurance companies, I, I'm not sure Missouri, if insurance yeah. companies cover uh, colonoscopies. If there's you know, blood mixed in stool, then uh, if there's blood mixed in stool, they often will, or unremitting rectal bleeding, they won't cover as a screen. So they won't cover if you just want to be checked. But, you know, there's a lot of people who have constipation, a lot of people. So the, the main symptoms of colon cancer are either of rectal cancers bleeding that, and colon cancer can be um, change in bowel habits, meaning if you have a bowel movement every single day, like clockwork, and over a month to two months, all of a sudden you're having it once every three to four days and, and things aren't changing, okay? 
that's something like change of bowel habits. Or if you go every two days, three days, and all of a sudden you're having liquidy stools every single day. So that's, that's one um, of the symptoms. Abdominal pain can be a symptom, but a lot of times when that happens, it's a, it's a little far in the game. Um, it's important for me to let people know that colorectal cancer, the reason I went into this field is uh, my mom passed away a month before I graduated med school. She, she had breast cancer and breast cancer treatment was not what it is today. And so that's always, I, that's always been very, very personal for me. Uh, my grandfather had colon cancer. I never got a chance to meet him. But also the reason I went into this because I wanted to be a superhero. And most patients, when you catch colorectal cancer early, okay, that means stage one, it has a 95% cure rate surgically. When you catch it in stage two, so stage two means that it's involved more of the, in, in deeper uh, thickness of the colon. However, you don't need chemotherapy. That means there's no lymph nodes involved. And so even that has a cure rate of about 82%. So stage three cancer, even if you have that, that means it's in the lymph nodes, okay? That's still, with all the chemotherapies we have today, is still 60% cure rate. Now, you're not a percentage, right? And I always tell my young patients that it's the gift and the curse having cancer because the curse is cancer. Nobody wants to have cancer, especially at this age. But the gift is that the immune system overall is very, very strong and they can fight it. They can deal with the high chemo and, and all of that. Now. For most cancers, if you have stage four and it's in other organs, you know, that is a very low survival rate. When we say survival rate um, in terms of how we study it and how we look at it, it's five year survival rate because that's how far you follow patients. And the thought is if you survive five years, then, you know, you're going to be good. And so the reason that, um, when you look at metastatic stage four cancer for colon cancer, it's still with the chemos and, and all the other treatments we have, it's about a 20 to 25 percent rate. Okay, now, and it's important to remember when you say those numbers, it's still looking at people who are over actually the age of like 60, 50 to 65. So, you know, we're getting more and more young people and we're seeing that they live longer and actually they can tolerate more of the chemo, but it's still not a death sentence. And a lot of things in our community, people think if you get it and you expose it to air, you're going to die. If you get it and you might as well just, just die. And that's not how it works these days. This is a very curable and if you can't cure it it's, it's a livable disease and that's really our goal is when it's stage four and sometimes stage three you want to make it livable where you you know have the surgery you get the chemo and then every once in a while your cancer could pop back up and you get treated again and that that is scary for some patients at first because you're always worried but eventually patients go on live their life and and you know they 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 survive and they thrive that's always my goal i don't i expect survival but I want thriving. I, I call patients my thriver survivors. That's really the goal now. You want people to thrive, not just live in their in their disease. Not just survive. say, Zuri, could you also tell them the youngest person you've seen thus far? Uh, the youngest person I've seen who I just was twenty two. And and the hard part with that is, is that, especially when, um, when they have a major family history. But the other hard part was, you know, similar to Michael, who you don't have a family history, but you, you have, you know, you finally get your colonoscopy, which was still early in the game. And you have a large number of polyps, which would portend to a some kind of genetic variation. Most colon cancers um, are actually uh, like the genetic predisposition to have them is actually very low. It's like 8%. And so most of the time it's actually most colon cancers occur in people with no family history still to this day, okay? And so that's not the only thing you use. But if you get a colonoscopy and you see uh, more than 100 polyps, you're automatically supposed to be given a referral to a colorectal surgeon because the chances that you can remove all those polyps are almost nil, and eventually those can turn into a cancer. And so once again, it's really hard for me when I have patients who do, do everything right, who have very supportive families and they still you know, are, are told to do something that's not accurate. And so that's still, a low, low percentage, but but I think when it comes to young people, people are a little more uh, cavalier in thinking that there's no way they can eventually have cancer, and and you know they don't necessarily do the always take the right steps. And the only thing I can say to that is, I and mean, look, it may cost you some money, but if you have any questions, I mean, because I know the insurance carriers aren't 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 paying for those things at a certain age, colonoscopies for people of of a certain age. But if you have any question with any of your friends, any of your friends' children, you know, any of your your children, pay the money, get a colonoscopy. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because the earlier you catch this stuff, the, 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 the more opportunity you have of getting through it. Right. Or, and, and also prevention. So, so you know, um, I've had an uptick in the last two months of young patients, uh, especially males coming in of their own volition. Okay. So I've done about maybe 45 in the last two months of, of patients who, who really, you know, were nervous about it. They either had remote family histories or minimal changes in bowel habits. And about 80% of these patients who are younger than 42. Okay. I found polyps like precancerous polyps. And, and, you know, we're seeing a trend of younger and younger patients. And so it's just really important to, to listen to your body. Okay. And, and try to have these good habits. Now, even if you haven't done this before, it's never too late for that. Thank you, Dr. Morell. Very enlightening. And uh, you know, it's like a classroom for me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now I'm going to bring up um, a third panelist, Dr. Sherilyn Cook. She, um, I actually met her, um, she was a freshman at Cal Poly. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Cook grew up in Compton, California, and completed her undergraduate education with a BS in biology at Cal Poly Pomona. She earned a master's of public health at UCLA and her medical degree at Stanford, where she was involved in community and school-based research projects on social determinants of health. Prior to attending medical school, she worked for nine years for the County of San Diego in various roles, including public health educator, budget and contract analyst, and assistant district manager for the welfare office, serving the homeless population in downtown San Diego. Dr. Cook completed her internship and residency at Alameda County Medical Center in Oakland, California, and then joined the Permanente Medical Group of Kaiser in 2001 as a primary care internist. She works as a primary care physician and serves as medical director for the medical weight management program and also has served as co-chief of patient education. She's president of the Sinclair Miller Medical Association, the local Bay Area chapter of the National Medical Association. And uh, to maintain her own physical and mental health, she swims, scuba dives, hikes, and explores as many Bay Area trails as possible on her horses. So um, with that, I'm going to bring up Dr. Cook. Thank you for being here. Okay. Thank you, Hubert. Thank you. And, and thank you, Dr. Morell. I love seeing a colorectal cancer surgeon speak about prevention that um, doesn't happen all the time. So I actually really love seeing that. So the focus tonight is on primarily the colon cancer, but I'm just gonna give a brief overview of general cancers that adults should be concerned with. And I think what Dr. Morell said is actually the number one thing. You have to be your own advocate and you must have a relationship with your primary care physician because that is frankly the key to getting just about anything done. And if you don't agree with some, you know, and honestly, primary care doctors, like all physicians, you know, we're people, we miss things, we make mistakes. And, you know, I'm the first person to tell someone when they come see me, and I've said it many times, I don't know what's wrong with you, but we're gonna figure it out. You know, and a lot of doctors don't like saying, I don't know. You know, I don't have a problem saying I don't know, and I think you need to find a doctor that's willing to say they don't know because your job is to figure it out if you don't know. So we talked about colon cancer already, and I can tell you that's personal to me as well. My father had a polyp, um, which was fought, found actually on the, the, the sigmoidoscopy, which we already talked about, which only looks at the distal third of the colon, it does not get the cold, cold colon. They found a polyp, they went back in, did a full colonoscopy to remove the polyp, so he was fine, he lived 89 years old. His sister was um, older than him, never had a colonoscopy in her life. Her sons, my cousins, bugged her. She was one of those people that absolutely refused to have a colonoscopy that I don't want that thing up my butt. 
And she lived to a ripe old age of 96. But I can tell you, had she not developed colon cancer in her late 90s and had a total obstruction of her colon, which was a terrible way to die, she'd probably still be here. So again, I think it's really important to understand that it's really important to get your colon screenings. I can tell you that um, I generally um, start screening people early, as he mentioned, you know, 45 years old. Typically, we start screening people at 50. The um, test, he said, is a, D it's a DNA test for blood in the colon, like the cologuard and some of those things. It's not a test for a polyp. And as he said, you move a polyp 100% you know, 90% of the time it's gone. So that's really important. But I want to move on to a couple of other types of cancers that are most common for women out there, breast cancer. I can tell you this is also personal to me. I am an 18 year breast cancer survivor. I developed it at age 41. So that was, you know, quite young. And again, I'll go back into the fact that we make mistakes and, you know, just looking back on it, I was diagnosed at 41, but when we pulled up my mammogram for 40, it was there and it was missed. So, but fortunately I'm still here 18 years later, so it's good. And then my sister recently developed breast cancer. So the things you should remember is generally it's age 40, but because I was diagnosed at 41, my sisters who are younger than me, they needed to be screened before age 40. Because whenever you have a family history of some type of cancer, generally, you need to be screened earlier. So I recommended that they get their mammograms right away because one's four years younger, one's six years younger, and they did. But you know, general ballpark, 10 years younger than your first degree relative, which could be a parent or a sibling. So if, say your mom had it at, at you know, 45, then you should be screened at 35. So I would recommend being screened earlier. That's really important. The standard for breast cancer screening is still mammograms, and you get women say, I don't want my boobs squished. But, you know, you have to have that conversation with them to discuss, you know, what are the repercussions of not having this done. And there are higher resolution things like the breast MRI that comes into play sometimes, but it's not a primary screening tool. So it's still a mammogram. The other one that is controversial right now is prostate cancer. It is definitely higher prevalence in African-American men. And controversially broke out several years ago when the United States Preventive Health Task Force no longer recommended standard PSAs, which is the blood test, the PSA test for prostate cancer. I can tell you that, you know, I still do PSA tests. And I recommend PSA tests, particularly for younger African-American men in their 40s because there's a higher rate of prostate cancer. And again, it's one of those um, cancers that if you catch it early, it's much more treatable than if it's later. And just like breast cancer, it's a much more aggressive disease in young men. Breast cancer is a much more aggressive disease in young women than it is in older men and women, which is just another phenomenon. So I would definitely want to have your conversations with your doctors about that prostate screening, breast cancer screening. It's really important. Another one is, of course, lung cancer, particularly for those who have been smokers. Now, there are lung cancers that occur in people who have never smoked. It happens. But the higher risk are people who've been smokers either currently or in the past. And, you know, recently we started doing, you know, in addition to screening, of course, if you have a cough or symptoms, you're going to get screened. But for high, you know, pack years, as we call it, smokers, there's high resolution CAT scans that are now being done for people to screen for lung cancer. It's not something you do every year because there's quite a bit of radiation in the high resolution CAT scan, but that's something else to keep in mind. Another one of cancer that I wanted to talk about that doesn't get a lot of attention are oral cancers. And there is a link between, you know, there could be a tonsillar cancer or, you know, just cancer somewhere in your mouth. And there's a link between human papilloma virus in a lot of these cancers. And how is there anybody heard about the HPV test they're giving teenagers now? The test, I'm sorry, the injections, the vaccinations for HPV? Yes. So HPV shots, which is still, some parents are not a fan of it, but these are things that can prevent cervical cancer. 
And they also can prevent the oral cancers, which are related to human papillomavirus. So I definitely encourage you to do your research on that. I don't have a daughter, but if I did, I would. And you know, boys are getting the injections now too as well. So that's something to think about. And if I'm not, um, I don't know what the prevalence rate of anal cancers with HPV is, Dr. Morell, but I think it's up there as well. And so anal cancer is 100% related to 100%. HPV. There you go. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. anal cancers and HPV. So and those are, you know, really important factors to think about. So I mentioned, you know, briefly cervical cancer. Usually we start screening women at 35. And typically you'll get an HPV test every three years because again, human papillomavirus has been associated with cervical cancer. It causes abnormal cells around the cervix, which can go on to develop into cervical cancers. So again, it's, you know, there's early screening can have a much better outcome, but if you back it up even more and for your younger kids and get the, you know, immunizations to prevent the HPV in the first place, you, you know, you are preventing cancers. That's what you are doing. So I think that is really important. And I think Dr. Morell touched on a lot of this already. I work a lot with a medical weight program because as we all know, obesity, poor foods, inactivity are not only associated with cancers, but of course, heart disease, stroke, you know, inflammatory conditions in the body, all types of things. So, you know, there are a lot of options out there, but I would say my primary recommendation to get healthy, stay healthy is number one, Dr. Morell mentioned fiber, but eat vegetables, eat vegetables and fruit. That should be the majority of your diet. And, you know, I've been involved with um, plant-based eating. Some of my wet medical weight patients, they're actually on, you know, liquid bars. It's a, it's a processed diet, but they're only on it for four months. And we're encouraging plant-based eating, if not complete plant-based, once they um, come out of that program. And also, you know, with heart attacks and strokes, you're getting a lot of results with people going to more plant-based diets, trying to cut out the meats trying to cut out a lot of processed food in particular. So I think those are things that are just really important for us to stay healthy in overall for cancer prevention, but also for general wellness. And, and if you can't say, well, I'm going to eat meat once in a while, that's fine. You know, have it once in a while, but don't have that. And particularly don't have junk food be the staple of your diet. Really encourage fruits and vegetables. And you know we see that a lot all the time that diet it plays such a big role with health in general and overall. And of course, physical activity during the pandemic has been a bit challenging. And um, oh, I just wanted to touch on, I made a few notes with um, Dr. Morell. He mentioned vitamin D. I can tell you 95% of people who I check a vitamin D level are deficient in vitamin D, period. You know, so I'm just gonna assume you're gonna, just assume you are low in vitamin D. So I recommend like my adult patients, 40 and 50 and over, that they take between 800 and 1200 uh, international units of vitamin D a day, as well as about 1500 to 2000 milligrams of calcium a day to help prevent osteoporosis, you know, and keep your um, bones together as well as other things. But yeah, just assume you're low in vitamin D you know, because just about everybody is. Um, and other than that, a good multivitamin. But you need to be aware of the general screening test. You need to have a relationship with your doctor. If you cannot connect with your doctor, go find a new doctor. If you need a second opinion, ask a second opinion. I do work in the Kaiser system, and we can get a second opinion. And I've done that many times. It's, it's, you know, on some really obscure things, it's been a battle, but I've even sent patients over to UCSF. Usually they reserve that for the specialist, but I've gone to bat for my patients. And if I want a second opinion outside, I get a second opinion outside. So that's just something to um, keep in mind. So that's about all I have, Hubert, and just we'll leave time for questions if people have questions of us. I think Hubert might be muted. Yeah, thank you so much, Sherilyn. Uh, that was uh, extremely valuable information and um, compounds 
on the comments that we've heard uh, earlier from uh, Dr. Morrell and uh, Michael Frierson. And uh, thank you so much. Um, I concur with everything that's been said so far and the observations and um, as what Michael is saying that, um, you know, you really have to um, really make your, your, your kids understand how important it is to get started with this early and to, to, to have the checkups, have the physicals, you know, I, I say have a, you know, have a holiday, you know, physical holiday where every year on a certain day or a certain week, you, that's, that's your, your day to go have a physical every year. And we need to, you know, train our young folks to uh, adopt that sort of thinking um, so that they can monitor uh, the, their health on a regular basis. I see a couple questions in the chat. Um, one was someone mentioned that um, they're diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease at age 40. Should your daughter be screened at age 30? So I don't know if there's a definite age for Hodgkin's disease, but your prim the primary doctor definitely needs to know, you know, your daughter's doctor definitely needs to know that the parent had a history of Hodgkin's disease and you know, a lot of times those things are gonna be picked up by symptoms, fatigue and abnormal blood count, stuff like that. So you know, it's not like a, um, a mammogram, you know, which is pretty cut and dried. If someone had breast cancer at 40, they need to get screened at 30. But definitely they need to be aware of it. And I mean, if a, per a patient came in to me and said, my mom or dad or somebody had Hodgkin's, I'm gonna, it's gonna be on my radar, I'm gonna order lab work, stuff like that. And the other question was how much calcium? I recommend 1,500 to 2,000 um, milligrams daily and um, 800 to 1,200 IU of vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Can I say something about the HPV also? Sure. Absolutely. So, so in terms of HPV, which you know, we work with a lot, um, you know, I have two daughters, okay? And, and about 75% of women will come into contact with HPV in their sexual lifetime, which means 100% of men also will probably do the same thing. Only about 25% of the time is it actually um, uh, kept by the body, okay? Um, a lot of times people don't wanna get their sons the HPV vaccine or even their daughters because they, there's a lot of misconceptions that in order for you to have anal cancer, you have to have anal sex, which is not true. Um, there's even some thought now that if a woman has changes on her pap smear um, that comes back as, as and comes back with HPV, certain types, they need an anal pap smear also, whether or not they have anal sex. So these are the taboos that, that actually are sometimes killing patients because that cancer, 90% of, of anal cancer is from, you know, is from HPV. And so this is something that you can, you can actually prevent in men and women when they're children and it will last them a lifetime and it's irrespective of anal sex. Okay, and that's something that I really wanna share. Great, thank you. Yeah, and women with cervical cancer, they can be HPV positive, they get dysplasia, they get a pap, they yeah. get you know a cone biopsy or whatever, they do a treatment, they can, or your body just naturally can clear it. But guess mm -hmm. what? It could come back. So right. you know, for a lifetime, it can come back several times. So yeah, that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with anal warts. So I deal with it a lot when there's anal warts, and anal warts come from HPV, but it's usually a lower risk HPV. Um, but that's something that also, you know, needs to be uh, needs to be treated, and that can prevent, you know, leading to cancer. So it's very important those two tests. Mm -hmm. In the chat, we have um, a question: uh, Do you have a preference between digital mammograms or regular mammograms? No, oh, I think they're, they're all digital these days. Really? Okay. They're all digital. Okay. And um, let's see, I have another one. This was a question that came in um, prior to. A um, person is concerned about black women and the dangers with giving birth in hospitals. Because of COVID or? No, I mean, you know, we've seen situations. I know Serena Williams had a situation. Uh, track runner Allison Felix also had a situation where, um, I, I don't know if it was during giving birth, but during their pregnancies, there were some difficulties that um, could have turned out badly. Hmm. 
Well, I know, I'm pretty sure Venus Williams had ended up with a deep vein thrombosis, which is a blood clot in the leg, which pregnancy causes a hypercoagulable state, you know, and the pressure from the uterus, you know, pressing on some of the large blood vessels in the body. So, I mean, that is a risk factor, but I don't know if it necessarily has to do with being in the hospital. Right. I think it's uh, the the uh, studies that show that African-American women still have the highest, um, you know, mortality rate still giving birth and also in same thing in the ER, right? Like in the ER studies show that African-Americans aren't giving, aren't giving pain medicine as much as, as much as other patients. So maybe that's what they're talking about. But I think, you know, it's still very safe unless you have the, the um, financial means to, you know, give birth at home with a midwife and things of that nature. There's other options, but but, uh, you know, I think that that's probably not an option for most most people, whether you're black, white or, or anything. But I think it's, you know, it's important to discuss that aspect with your, you know, with your doctor. Mm-hmm. Also, and tell them that that's a concern that you have. And, and, you know, they should be able to, you know, articulate, you know, why they think that is and why that won't happen to you. Well, I mean, African-American have the highest infant mortality rate in the United States, period. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. Women, you know, whether it's lack of prenatal care, you know, a lot of people show up late. Um, and, you know, so, yeah, so it, it makes sense that it would carry over the complications in the hospital, but I don't know if it's necessarily right. because right. they're in the hospital. Right. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, there are, there are obviously, you know, there's issues right now with COVID. People are afraid to go to hospital for just about anything, right. um, you know, that you have to, you know, encourage people to, to go in. But, you know, I think right now, particularly with COVID, they're doing a really good job of keeping COVID isolated, non-COVID. So you're not, you know, I have to tell patients all the time, I send them to the ER. No, I'm like, well, no, the COVID patients are upper respiratory going to go here. You're going to go there. It's going to be two separate areas. So right. we're really doing a good job of mixing them. And quite frankly, we're not taking them in clinic right now either. We're sending them to um, the emergency department where they literally have separate sections and sometimes even tents set up to screen because we're not, we're trying hard not to bring them in the clinic. And you shouldn't put off your, you know, your colorectal screening. You shouldn't put these things off. I mean, there's been people, you know, we've had some COVID casualties because people have put things off, put things off, which I can understand because it's, it was very scary, but you know, all the patients, especially if you have an elective procedure, you're brought in through a different entrance and all these things. And we have to get COVID tests before you even can do these procedures. So you really have to make sure you still get your mammograms. You still do your colonoscopies and your proper screenings because, you know, you don't want to die because you didn't. Absolutely. And, you know, I can tell you, though, um, colonoscopies, I know for when the pandemic first yeah, started, started, all the elective stuff got shut down immediately. But it's open back up now. So, I mean, we've got protocols in place. So you should not prevent, you know, I have a, you know, I had a with patient the other day, she wanted to come in for a mammogram. Look, we don't even have COVID patients here. You know, you need to go get your mammogram done. But um, yeah, people are afraid of it for those reasons, right? And now. if you have symptoms, once again, you shouldn't, especially, you know, like blood mixing stool, things of that nature, you know, then you can still get things done if it's diagnostic. But, you know, it's just important to still, uh, you know, don't use COVID necessarily as an excuse not to still take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. I'm just curious, Dr. Murrell, are you seeing many docs doing SIGs anymore? We're not hardly doing any SIGs. No, right but no, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, not, not as much anymore. Not as much yeah. anymore. Which yeah, is like, we just need the colonoscopy. Need exactly. the whole okay. I had a couple of questions uh, sent in regarding um, supposed disparity in treatment for Black community. And I know Dr. Morell talked about a couple of things that um, kind of uh, runs up this avenue here. Yeah, about the, you're right. So, you know, I don't think that there's necessarily people saying I'm going to treat this black person different than I treat my white patients, right? But the, but the data doesn't lie in terms of um, all the studies saying that, you know, from different specialties, uh, patients who are African American do better with African American doctors. And I think part of that is, is that, you know, when we're in med school, we're trained on everybody, which typically, you know, are ca- Caucasians. That's how we were trained. And so we even have these, you know, these um, modules where they have actors come in and play patients. And I mean, you know, thinking back on it, you know, there were hardly any African-American patients, but we know how to talk to each other. And also we know how to, how to, um, you know, tell people things that they may not want to hear, but they need to hear, 
you know, it's and and make sure that people get it done. And I think it's other doctors that and a lot of all of us have implicit bias. Right. And so one of the goals I, I'm trying to to uh, get done is is trying to make sure when doctors maybe get privileges or when when doctors, uh, you know, every couple of years, you got to get privileges at a hospital. I think doctors should take an implicit bias training. OK, because we all have that. And at least that will make you aware of some of the biases that you actually have. And then you hopefully will seek out, um, you know, treatment for that. You, they will seek out uh, workshops, things of that nature. But that's why I say that in this day and age, it's important to, to kind of do your own research and don't just pick a doctor because they're black or whatever, but just make sure whoever that doctor is, you're very, you are comfortable with them and they are comfortable with you. You know, one of the big things um, I had trouble with with some of my African-American patients, I sent them to the nutritionist, whoever that was. Right. And a lot of times, I mean, it wouldn't help because the nutritionist often wouldn't talk about the kind of foods that my patients like to eat and how to actually make that more healthy. You know, so finally, I found an African-American woman who actually is a nutritionist and there's not a lot. You know, there's not a lot. And, and patients have been doing amazing with weight loss, with with everything, because they feel like they could talk to the patient. The patients would see these other nutritionists and they would say, OK, and then you never see them again. You know, and, and so I think that some of those things are, are very important. And a lot of times the nutritionists don't even think about it like it's. It's just, okay, I recommend hummus, which I do love hummus. But, you know, a lot of times if I send one of my 70-year-old patients to them and they, all of a sudden it's, it's hummus, this, that, and the other, you kind of got to ease people into things, right? And, and people aren't necessarily aware of their own paradigm. Like, this is what I tell all my patients. But what you tell all your patients may not be right for all your patients. And, and you know, you're, you can lead people there. You can say, how, did the, how do you make the food that you're currently eating more healthy? And then move them in this other direction. But I think you have to realize that in yourself, that maybe you're not – you know, you're not uh, speaking the same language or you're not doing something to actually help them. And I think that, you know, we all have these, we all have these biases. I mean, we're taught in med school to never not tell a patient, um, you know, you always tell the patient their actual stage and prognosis, okay? And we try to do that, but I've had, you know, patients who are 90 years old and the, the daughter comes, the husband comes, everybody comes and, and, you know, says, doctor, can you just not use the word cancer you know so I'm, I'm i'm you know trying to figure out how do i how do i do that you know uncontrolled cell growth this that and the other you're going to need chemotherapy you know I, I still say all the things that are important because patients need to know but you know it's still culturally you you know eventually i don't just give it to them right away you know so so i've had to learn you know these different cultures and uh and i think the number one thing was i was open to it i'm open to hearing i don't act like i know everything i purposely when i see my patients i actually sit lower than the patient so I'm always that the patient's actually looking down on me because I just remember when I was a kid going to doctor's offices, they'd be in the white coat. And I always wear this. I usually just wear black scrubs. I don't even wear a coat because what I have to do is I have to make a patient feel comfortable enough with me in like 10 to 20 seconds for me to examine one of the most, you know, private parts that a patient has. The actual best part of my job is just meeting people, talking to them and actually developing a rapport that allows me to help them and to do that quickly. Okay. And so me standing in a white coat, standing above them and, and kind of dictating to them, I don't think that works anymore. And, and I don't think it ever really worked. And so when I, when I sit the way I sit and we talk, I think a patient feels more at ease and, and it's more of a team. If I have a patient come in who's older, especially with cancer, or even if they're younger, I ask them, what is your goal? You know, some patients say, hey, I had a great life. I don't want to go through this horrible chemotherapy. And we talk about it, you know, but I'm never telling you what you should do. I tell you what I think and we work it out together. And I just think that that is the kind of relationship you, you 100% need to have that relationship with your family medicine doc. Most surgeons aren't like me. A lot of them are, are old school and, you know, they just want to cut it out and, and go. I personally don't look at, don't ever want to be that guy or that, you know, I don't want to be like that. I actually like to have relationships with my patients and just to, uh, to you know, to explore their goals. And, you know, luckily I can do that uh, because, you know, I work in a, in a setting where I don't take insurance, but I, I take Medicare, but I also work out with patients all the time. We talk about things. We, we, I still don't lose patients because of that. And I think that that's, for me, obviously I like to talk. And if I had a different kind of practice, I couldn't do that. So, you know, I, I, I am lucky because I think I know who I am and I know how I can help people. And, and I'd, rather, I'd rather be the way I am and help people, you know, with all aspects of, of their medical care. Um, and maybe not see as many patients than to, you know, do something different. So I'm, I've been lucky to be able to do that. And if I can say one thing, we've been extremely lucky to have Dr. Morell as, as, as my son's physician. 
realistically, he probably shouldn't be alive today, and he's lived for a good four or five years after this, after the more diagnosis. Like more and more. A lot, a lot of that stuff is because of Dr. Morell and his relationship and how and his demeanor with uh, you know how he addresses issues with my family as well as with my son. And I'm going to tell you, you can't you can't underplay that. That is hugely significant. Because when it gets really, really tough, and you feel like you can't make it anymore. Sometimes it's that physician that's sitting next to you saying, hey, you're going to get through this. Okay. So that's a, that's a real important thing to everybody that's listening to this. You know, if your physician is talking over your head, that's a problem. Yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely a problem. And, you know, it's, you know, physicians have a tendency to do that. And I think that it's really important to stop them and say, can you please explain that to me in plain English? You know, we should be trained to speak in plain English, but sometimes some of us don't. So I think if we're going over your head, you need to stop us and don't feel bad about that and ask. You know, one of the techniques I use with my patients all the time is I explain, you know, something to them and then I'll ask him, well, can you teach me back? Can you talk to me and tell me what I just, you know, what is your understanding of what I just told you? Because I need to make sure they understand, not just I told you, do you understand? So, and you know, and I don't put it that way, but I'll ask a few questions to make sure that they understood what I was saying. And usually with my patients, it's around medication schedules or things like that, you know, or even dietary things. But you know, that's, that's, sometimes we are not good at that. We need to be better at that as physicians. But, you know, we really have to connect with the patient. We really have to communicate well. We have to make sure that they understand and that we get their perspective. You know, the whole diet thing is, you know, very interesting. It's true, you know. I mean, they don't teach us anything in any of our stuff about how to cook greens, you know. I mean, and African-Americans eat greens. And, you know, there's ways that they can be prepared and tasty that's still healthy without putting a lot of fat in them and things like that. So I think it's um, really important that you understand who you're dealing with, you know, what their cultural biases are or, you know, where they're from. I mean, if you're going into have a patient who's from Ethiopia, you can't talk about certain um, types of foods that they're not familiar with and you may not be familiar with what they're eating. So... I think it's just really important to have those conversations. Great. Okay, well, we're down. We've got about a little over five minutes left. Um, so I have one final question here that uh, was sent in, um, and this is addressed to uh, both of our doctors. In a world full of uncertainty, how has your role impacted you as a physician, and how will the new generation benefit from your actions? <laughs> um. You want to go first? Dr. Cook? Sure, I'll go first. Well, I look at it like this. As I said, I was diagnosed with breast cancer at 41. So I figured I'm already on borrowed time. So, you know, there's always uncertainty. So I feel that, you know, you have to consider, um, you know, again, what your goals are, like what Dr. Morell said. You know, I decided, hey, I want to live and I want to do everything possible to assure that I can live. And so 18 years. I'm still, you know, well and healthy. So that, you know, that was my goal. And I was, you know, open about that. So I think the key is you really just have to look at, you have to live every day the best you can, you know, live your life to the fullest. None of us, is, you know, we're physicians, but life to me isn't promised tomorrow and it isn't to any of us. So I think we do the best we can, take care of yourselves, follow the healthy habits, and just find, I think it's really important too that everyone has to have some kind of passion, something that they really enjoy doing. And, you know, like I think it was probably, it was too much, Hubert, but my thing is horses. I've been riding horses since I was a kid. And, you know, for me, get on my horse, go out, ride in a regional park, see the trees, hear the birds, look at the air, you know, that's where, that's where I kind of restore myself. So I think those kind of things are really important, particularly in this day and age with all the stress from all kind of factors that we have going on. So that's, that's my philosophy. Two things that I remember from when I very first met you was the horses and that you were, <laughs> and that you were a swimmer. <laughs> yeah, still doing, I, I haven't changed, <laughs> just got old. 
competitive swimmer. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Yubi, could I could I also kind of add to that a little bit? Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I, I want to say the one thing about this uh, this situation that that has happened with my son is giving me really the um, appreciation of every day, and I think sometimes we discount that. You know, we always think that there's going to be tomorrow or the next day, or you know, we'll address those things five years from now. And you know, looking at the you know the state of the world today, two things that really changed my perspective: that situation that happened in Vegas, where that man shot all those people from the hotel room, changed me drastically because that made me understand that this thing, this whole whole life journey, you know, is 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 never guaranteed. People say that. But do you really sit down and think about it? And like I said, this situation with my son really has made me understand. I talk to my kids every day. Mm -hmm. Both of my sons, I talk to them every day. And they think that's weird. You know, <laughs> man, sometimes they even block me, but I still leave them voicemails and texts. <laughs> you know, because you better appreciate these days. I mean, you better appreciate them because you don't know how long or you don't know when negative things get or something could happen to you. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned the situation in Vegas. Uh, one of my colleagues was killed there and I spoke with her like three days before and she was excited because she had just gotten her ticket to that event. Yeah. Uh, with her. And you're absolutely right. Um, you just don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. And yeah. so, day is a gift, it's valuable, and we need to let each other know that they're important to us and that we love them. Dr. Morell. I mean, um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, the, the light of my life is my two daughters and my wife. And so, you know, it's funny because I live in Long Beach and I commute, you know, to Cedars. And, and you know, so I was spending uh, probably three hours a day in the car, really. And, uh, you know, my daughters are 13 and 11 now growing up. And I realized that you know, a lot of times when we say we're doing it for the family, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm working this hard and making a living for the family. A lot of times, you know, you're actually doing it for yourself. Um, what, no matter what that, what that means. And, and, uh, you know, so I opened another office out here just really so I could be close to my kids at least two days a week. I tried to take them to school and, and really, you know, I love them with all my heart, but I, I didn't know if they really, and I told them that all the time, but I don't know if they really felt it. And my wife would always say, my wife's a surgeon also. Um, and she's an ophthalmologist. And, uh, you know, the, the love is built a lot of times in the little moments. So, you know, I we would always go you know, on vacation together. And I love that because I'm out of the country. I can't be, you know, I don't have to deal with anything. I'm just hanging out with the, with the kids. Um, we then started doing, you know, big things. Like we go to Uganda every, every two to three years to do medical mission. My daughter's work in an orphanage and my wife and I operate. Um, this is the first year ever where, where Uganda was like, no, Americans, you guys stay here with this COVID. You guys stay here. So we didn't get to do that. That is so reinvigorating because it's neat to help somebody who you get nothing out of it. You don't, other than that feeling of why you really went into medicine. I don't have to worry about, you know, billing. I don't have to worry about staff. You don't worry about any of that. So, so giving back, like I always thought my job was great because I just gave back anyway. And, you know, I still think you have to go above and beyond that. I, uh, I try to say that if, if there's not more, um, more doctors like me when I retire, I have failed. There are less um, doctors, uh, African American doctors, than there were in 1974. Sure. Okay. 1974. There's less of us. Um, I, I love. I love giving back. Uh, love giving back to the community. Um, the other thing with my daughters, though, that my wife was telling me, and she's right, is that the little moments are probably more important than these big trips we do. Just being present. You know, just having the conversation at dinner and all that. And so, you know, I've really worked on that, and I just. Uh, you know, they keep me centered, they keep me grounded. And, uh, you know, one dream I have is when, is when people, um, especially African Americans, maybe one day won't stop me in the hall just because they're a doctor to tell me that I'm, that they're proud of me. That's how few there of us there are. You know, there's a, there, and, and so I, I appreciate that. But it also makes me sad that there's not enough, there's not that many of us where it becomes, uh, it becomes just commonplace, you know? And I'm hopeful that that will that that will happen one day. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. All of the participants here, I want to thank uh, each of you for your interest. And I hope that you found this conversation informative, encouraging and educational. And finally, I want to I want you to please join me in thanking our panelists, uh, Michael Farson, 
Diane Frierson, Michael Jr., thank you so much. Thank for, you. Thank you. Thank you. Who um, actually put something like this together and, and, and offering your story to share with others because I know that it's, it's been a difficult journey thus far. Uh, we pray for you and your family, and uh, we just, um, you know, we'll, we'll be thinking about you and checking in with you. Dr. Morell, thank you so much for participating. And Dr. Cook, thank you so much. I really appreciate each of you. And um, I want to wish each of you well and uh, just, uh, you know, continue to do what you're doing. And uh, we'll see you soon. Can I ask one, add one more thing, Mr. Crawford? On, a, on Friday on the TV show, uh, the uh, doctors at two o'clock, um, I'm gonna be on there, it's already recorded, um, discussing colorectal cancer health, uh, African-Americans uh, with uh, Kevin Fraser and Dr. Ian. And uh, I think it's, a really, it's gonna be a really informative uh, segment. That's great, thanks. Sure. Thank you. So with that, that's uh, pretty much it for this evening. Um, we look to um, try to do maybe a quarterly Black Health Forum. Um, and so that's kind of what we're striving toward. Um, for those of you who are Cal Poly alums, uh, check out uh, the Alumni Association and Black Alumni and Friends online. And uh, we'd love to have you get involved. Uh, we've got a very uh, vigorous uh, calendar of events together. And this is just one of, uh, one of those events. And, and we have a lot of things going in many different categories. So uh, anyway, I look forward to seeing all of you uh, again here real soon. Thank you. Thank you.